Hello everybody and welcome back to our next live interview. I'm joined here today by David Thomas. David is a Sunday Times number one bestseller. He's spoken in 24 countries and has received a Speaker Hall of Fame award. Um, he's also a Guinness, a Guinness memory record breaker for memorizing and reciting um, and a US memory champion as well. Uh, David, he's, um, you've got an amazing story, David, actually, which I hope, hopefully we're gonna go through today. Um, which, you know, the whole idea of your story is how to become world-class. I'm going to dive into that a little bit, which I'm really excited about. Um, and what I'd like to do as well is David's going to hopefully give lots of our members advice and tips uh, on how to improve your homeschooling and how to really accelerate your learning. So a massive welcome to you today, David. Thank you for inviting me, Seb. Wonderful to be here. How are you today? You all right? You know, I'm all right. It's weird. The world is is kind of, it feels like it's slowly ground to a halt. And yet I'm here. The weather's amazing. I'm in Yorkshire, the north of England. The weather is grand. Amazing. Good stuff. It's um, it's slowly easing back here in Dubai. They've released some some of the laws. So, um, you know, move permits and stuff have been cancelled. So people are experiencing the outside life for the first time, which is, which is quite nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, hope, hopefully the, the UK will experience that soon again too. So, um, so David, um, amazing background. Just reading that, I'm sort of blown away. You know, what a what an amazing you know bunch of achievements you've had over over the years. You know, and I remember from one of our previous chats as well. And um, you know, Oprah as well. You've been on Oprah's show and and a few a few other amazing stories. Is it true you you've spoken to half a million students around the world as well? Absolutely, yes, yes. Just because, you know, I go into a school and the school, you know, I always charge a school. I don't do work for free. A, a fair exchange is no robbery. So I go in and I do the work. And, you know, they say, right, I'm going to give you all my students. And they just put 300 kids in. We do an hour. And then, we do, you know, they they disappear. They bring another 300 in, do another hour. And, you know, so that and that's what I want to do is I want mm. to go into a school or an, an educational environment, have massive impact, the biggest impact I can have. And, yeah, and talk to as many students as I can. But, you know, you can quite easily find yourself speaking to five, six, ten thousand students in a week sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do a sort of similar thing here. When, uh, whenever we kind of start new clubs in a new area, we go into a school and we teach the whole school. And so, you know, we can teach two or three thousand students in a week. So I know exactly where you're coming from. And I know, I know how, uh, how much hard work that is. <laughs> so um, amazing, half a million. That's, that's the thing absolutely amazing. The thing about amazing. students is you don't really get a lot back. I mean, they yeah. might be having a great time, but they're not telling a face. And they just yeah. sit there and go, all right, mate, you crack on. I'll just stand here and watch it. <laughs> I mean, they come up at the end and they go, that was amazing. Or they share some amazing ideas or they come online and say, look, just want to tell you, I was, you know, I saw your session last, you know, last year and I got the grades that I needed and so on. So, yeah, I know they're having a good time, but they don't really inter interact. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so before we go into your background, I, I'd, I'd love to share your story with all of our Warrior family because, you know, it's, it's a really incredible story. Uh, but before we go into that, could you tell me a little bit about David today? What is David doing today? Well, I mean, before lockdown, I was a presentation skills coach. I, you know, I spend a lot of time with chief execs working one to one on specific talks. They come to me and they go, you know, what? I've got this big talk, House of Commons, whatever. These are the kind of talks I do. And I go, I can help you, you know, really shine and be a presentation rock star on stage. I create presentation rock stars. But aside from that, I'm an educationalist. And, you know, the very back in the day, the very first sessions I was I was doing were on brain training, memory, mind mapping, speed reading, accelerated learning and revision. And straight away, I went into schools and I started working in schools. And that's always been a common thread. In fact, the two sessions I've done today commercially for companies were for members of staff, both on memory, because it's still an incredibly valuable skill. And if you learn how to learn at, a, at the right age, particularly as a young adult, by the time you get into 13, 14, the exams are starting to hurt a bit. If you can learn how to learn then, not only do you get good exams, but you can move forward and be more successful in life because life is, you've got to learn all the time. The speed at which the world is turning when you eventually get back up to speed, is so quick that you've got mm. no choice. But for me, that's what I do. I'm a professional speaker and I just get up, get in my car, do me 30,000 miles in my car, do me 100,000 miles a year in a plane, speak in eight, nine, 10 countries a year and speak to 10, 20,000 people. 
Amazing. Wow. And, and yeah, completely agree with what you're saying. You know, that skill of learning to learn is just, you know, such a, such a vital skill. And, and I think ultimately, if you, if you are, if you've got a system in place, which helps you accelerate your learning, you're able to develop at such a faster rate. You know, you're working smart, not just hard. You're not just putting in the hours and hours of revision and studying. You, you're able to, you know, to, to leverage your time to make sure you're, you're being as efficient as possible, right? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, hard work counts for a great deal. I think that if you drive something through by pushing it really hard, you find out where the breaking point is. You find out where the areas are that you're struggling. I think too many times, and this particularly is boys at 15, 16, they get through by doing the bare minimum. And I get mm. that. I was that kid. Girls yeah. work harder than boys. It's always been known. <laughs> Karen, my good lady, was a math teacher for 14 years. She said the girls were always more motivated. Why? Yeah. Girl? But broadly speaking and but the thing is that if you work hard then you find out where the problem is and then once mm. you've got the problem or the weak area what you then need to do is find a strategy because if you just keep on you know banging your head you know against that brick wall you're just going to get a very sore head so it's a question of both work hard drive it forward find out where the edge of your ability is and then when you need something to fill in the gap a strategy then you go out there you find people like me or stuff online because there is a strategy online for everything, right? For everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Right. Just spend an hour typing in the most ridiculous thing. Somebody's doing a YouTube video on it, right? <laughs> so we can find strategies for anything. But the most important thing is don't keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result because mm. we all know the classic phrase, which is, you know, that's that's a de definition of somebody who's a bit of an idiot, let's be honest. If, if you do the same thing, get the same result, that's, that's not going to work. So work hard, but also be prepared to adopt and adapt, try new stuff. Brilliant, brilliant. So, um, so jet setting around the world, speaking in, you know, almost 10 countries a, a year, you know, live TV, speaking to almost a million students so far, but that wasn't always the case, was it? And, you know, your story is, is very inspiring. It's something I've been very inspired by. Would you mind taking us through um, the life of young David and how you kind of grew up? Well, I grew up in a very uh, working class background. My mother was a receptionist. My stepfather was 65 years old when I was six. And unfortunately, things weren't great at home. But it just meant that by the time I got to 16, I got expelled from school. You know, it was a difficult time. But I moved on from that, I ended up working in a factory because I didn't have the qualifications. I mean, you know, when you're 16, 17, 18, unless you have the qualifications, then you're not going to really be able to move forward. That's your view on the world. That's your window. That's your little piece of paper that says this is what you are. And that's why I say to students, when I go and talk to 16-year-old students in school, it's amazing how many of them go, I'm not, I'm not doing the exams, Dave. I just don't want to do it. I go, great, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to be a YouTuber. I'm going to do this or do that. And I go, fine. If you could do those things, brilliant. Absolutely. Have at it. You know, the, I mean, there are 250, 300 million dollars worth of games sold a day. Wow. It, it, it's incredible. We understand that, you know, what is in there. And now there are people making a lot of money gaming. And that's great if that's what you want to do. But if that doesn't work out, the only thing you've got is that little piece of paper that says what's different, what grades you've got. And so, you know, I said, I don't care whether you want to study or not. I'm just going to help you get the best grades you can. So you've got the best opportunity and the most options. So those are the two things you want. You want the most opportunity, you want the most options. But for me at 16, I didn't have that. I went to work in a factory, then went to work in an office. 20, I became a firefighter. Amazing. Loved it. Why? Because I'm a working class guy from the north of England. Only one in 40 people who applied to become a firefighter got in. So all of a sudden, I'm in the top two and a half percent. I felt valued and, and people gave me recognition. And it wasn't an ego thing. It was just simply a question. But at that time, I'd never had that. And that's what you really want. We all want to be recognized as being valuable to society and to other people. So I'm 20, I'm a fireman, and I'm loving the job, but I can't pass my promotion exams. I'm sat there and it's like, you know, what am I going to do? And so really, that's the first kind of quarter, quarter I'm 52. And, you know, that's that was the first half of my life so far, which was not great background, struggling like crazy, you know, a comprehensive school in a valley, rural deprivation, all that other kind of terrible stuff that happens still to this day. Eventually get out, become a firefighter, fairly working class job, but one with massive recognition. And I thought that was it. I thought that was it until I retire at 50. Wow. So 
Amazing. Okay, so what? So there was like a turning point. You you went through this turning point where you decided to make a change, or? Well, I was sat. I, I mean, I was wanted to pass my promotion exams. Who wouldn't? I didn't really think I had what it took to be an officer. I didn't. I didn't even like the idea of being an officer. I was the kind of guy who wanted to run into burning buildings when everybody else was running out. Call, call me crazy. But as a firefighter, when you join the job, you join it to be a firefighter. You don't join it to write to to do paperwork. And I could see that the officers had to do all the paperwork and stayed outside the fire. I wanted to go in and, and be a hero. That's what I wanted to do. It's what I joined to do. And so for me, it never really bothered me. And then, so I'm just drifting along, but I'm not in a place of unhappiness. But at the same time, I've got no options or opportunity, like I've already mentioned. Because mm. if I don't get the exams, I can't get promoted. They don't come along and go, you know what, Dave? You seem a really nice guy. Here's a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> why would they do that they go but you can't pass the exams and i go okay i get that and that's what i tell the students again i say to the students there's no point in saying i'm a really good kid and i'm hard working if you've spent the last 11 years at school and got nothing it just, this, there's a mismatch so anyway i'm sat there i'm watching tv one night as, as i am bored a bit on a tuesday night and i saw a guy come on and memorize a pack of playing cards and i'm like that is very interesting because mm. it wasn't magic when somebody makes a rabbit appear out of a hat, they've not been able to do that. They create mm. the illusion. And I'm watching it. And, you know, you sit there, you're kind of, kind of scratching everything and going, how's he done that? How's he done that? Because at the end of the day, unless he cheated, and I kind of just assumed he hadn't, if he hadn't cheat, if he, unless he cheated, how had he memorized 52 playing cards, which have 104 pieces of information on, in three minutes? Wow. And then he got tested, so they go, what's card number four? And you go, it's Jack of Hearts. And I was like, what? Wow, that's cool. Go, where's, the, where's the two of spades? And he go, number 36. And I go. <laughs> and I'll start there going, this is blowing my mind. Yeah, Never right. Seen Never seen it before. Never it would have, it would have felt before. like magic, right? That, that level of being able to recite and memorize would have, would have looked like magic, really, right? Well, it's, it's something like, it was, it was almost spooky. I mean, yeah, how, yeah. Do you, how do you define it? How do you define somebody who can memorize? You know, I, I do this as a job 20 years yeah. later, 25 years later. I give people a, a list of objects like I did today, 20 objects, for you know, for a couple of minutes or whatever. And, mm. and they look if they can get 12. Wow. This guy memorized 104 pieces of information under the pressure of live television. Yeah. And, and the gap's too big. And you mm. just sit there and go, oh, you know what? He's, he's gifted. And so what you do is yeah. all those comments come in, right? All those self-limiting beliefs. He's gifted. He probably went to a great school. I don't know how he's doing it, but I could never do that. And I left it. So I left it for a few weeks. And then I went out in Leeds, big city in the north of England. And, and I go into a shop, Waterstones, a bookshop. And I just said to this woman, I said, have you got any memory books? And she went, yeah, they're over there on a pile. So I go over and I don't believe in, I'm not spiritual. I don't believe I'm not religious. I'm, I, you know, I don't believe in pixies in a garden shed. I don't believe any of that. But his book, the guy I saw on the TV, was on top. So wow. and, that, and so this this was like a you know when you when you look back and you join up the dots in your life, this was one of those milestone moments where it just sort of changed the course of your life, right? It did. Now, yeah. the one thing <laughs> that I've taught people, and I've always said, just tattoo this on your head. Every time you look in the mirror, use this as a mantra. Only learn from a world-class source, right? Mm -hmm. Only learn from a world-class source because, trust me, I, I have seen a lot of people on Facebook in the last month who are amazing at virology, mm -hmm. absolutely stunning <laughs> at epidemiology, and they've never... Had a yeah. white coat, never had a white coat on in their yeah, life. A, lot, a lot of experts that you wouldn't, you know, a lot of people on your friends list popping out, you didn't realize were experts. No. <laughs> just going, Dude, stop it. You embarrass it to yourself. You sound, you know, yeah. you make yourself sound like an idiot. So the thing is that people will have, I mean, diet. The worst thing you can ever do is tell anybody you're going on the diet, what you need to do. If you need to do this, I've been on the cabbage soup diet, and you go, dude. Have you got a degree in physiology? No. Have you got a degree <laughs> in nutrition? No. Well, disappear. Or other words to that effect from a Yorkshireman. And it's like, <laughs> really? Really? But that's what happened. So the thing is that when I bought Dominic's book, he'd won the World Memory Championships, I think, three times by that point. It'd only been going five years. He was mm. the outstanding premier memory guy on the planet, bar none. And wow. I bought his book. 
And so I learned from a world-class source. And the bottom line is I took it home. I read it. It taught me to do one thing, which is memorize a list of 10 objects. I could do it in five minutes. And I'm sat there in a bed sit. So I was living in a bed sit. I had no money. Mm -hmm. It was the size of this room here, one room, kitchen in one corner, bed, bed in the other, you know, and a TV and a sofa in the middle. And that was it. And I was sat there going, what's going on? I can do with it. I can do this. So before I could get like six objects out of 10, now I could do all 10 backwards. I'm like, what else is in the, in this book? <laughs> wow. like, oh. yeah. I start, anyway, our bottom line is, is short, you know, long story short, start teaching myself everything in the book. Found out there was a world memory championships where okay. you get 10 events and you get tested. You met the most number of cars you can memorize in an hour, how many numbers you can memorize in an hour, how many mem numbers you can memorize in five minutes. Bottom line is, I went. Um, first, you know, and for a weekend, that was the weekend that changed my life. Yeah. And of course, I came fourth in the world. And wow. on, the Friday, on the Friday, this was a hobby in my back bedroom. And on the Monday, I'm getting read by a million people in the Times. So, so I mean, sorry, how, how long was that time frame from when you bought the book to when you 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 had you had entered the World Championships for for memory and reciting? Right. Eight eight months. Eight months. Eight months. I'd gone through like 25 years of my life, hardly been able to memorize <laughs> anything. And I always give the example, right? Yeah. I've just, I just gone through life being a bit of an idiot. And then all of a sudden I could do kind of crazy stuff. So I always give the example that when I when I was doing my promotion exams in the fire service, one of the things you have to learn is 13 things that are on a fire extinguisher. I couldn't yeah. do it. I just couldn't remember the 13. <laughs> one year after buying this book, eight months yeah. after buying the book, I could memorize 1300 digits in an hour backwards wow so 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 did you then use these skills straight away and and you know you use that to pass the pass the course the test with the fire with the firefighting or no you no. you made a sudden change of career well, the thing is i kind of i kind of realized fairly quickly i didn't want to be a fireman anymore. Right. i was like <laughs> because the thing is i was like i don't know everybody's got an ego but now yeah. i was this kind of superstar i mean I, yeah. phoned up the local, I phoned up the local radio station and tv and i said you know I, I don't know if you're really interested in this but i've just done this memory thing and and they went when can you come on i was like like tomorrow and they gave me six minutes on regional television at, at prime time at tea time this is like a 20 percent of the show was given up to me mm -hmm. and it was like and they were all going you know you're amazing i was like no, no, I, I just bought a book and did a yeah. few techniques. And they went, yeah. no, dude, you, you're like, you've got something special. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like a year ago, I couldn't memorize 13 things. And yeah. then, then, this is amazing. So, you know, you start believing, um, you know, you start believing in yourself a bit more that you have something to share. And, and it just grew. And I, within a few weeks, I was doing a course on the fire, in the fire service. Then my boss said, do you want to teach this? I said, not really. He said, no, mm. you should, because it's amazing. And so all of a sudden, I love being a fireman, but I saw this had potential. Mm. And then there was a moment a couple of years later, I started doing it commercially. And there was just a moment in 98 when I went to do a talk for a company and I get put, I get I I got paid more in a day for doing that one talk on memory than I did in a month being a firefighter. Wow. And life isn't about money until you've got none. Yeah. And I, I didn't have any as a firefighter. Firefighter is not a highly paid job. And at the time, you know, I mean, you know, I had a I had a partner, I had two kids, but and so all of a sudden I was able to do something different. That, that you know, all of a sudden people were going, "Do you want to come talk for me?" I was like, "Yeah, where is it?" And they got Iceland, and I was like, <laughs> "Did you say Iceland?" And I go, "They go, yeah, you come speak in Iceland." And I was like, "And you're going to pay him?" And they go, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And I was like, "Okay." And, <laughs> and it was just like wild. And it, before I knew where I was, I was in India and I America and speaking in Vegas. I spoke at Caesar's Palace, and it all just became. It was just a wild ride. Wow. So, so how many, is it 24 countries you've now spoken in? Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Amazing. So what, I, I, this was, in this was like a really... Monaco. I was in Gibraltar last year. I was in yeah. Spain. I was in Iran. Iran. Who got, I mean, you know, it's yeah. not really one <laughs> holiday, holiday hotspot destination. You know, for wow. most people, but fourth, fourth time I've been to Iran, I step up, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Iran, 
And and I turn up and there's like 200 people waiting for me at the airport. It's just wow. wild. And then I, and this is midnight and there's TV crews coming to see me. And I turn <laughs> up at this event. I'm only speaking twice for 40 minutes. And, and I get a stand on stage in front of 3,000 people and they're going, David, David, David. <laughs> it, it's about as close to being a rock star as I'm going to yeah, get. Yeah, right. A memory rock star. <laughs> I know. So, so this was, I mean, this is just sounds incredible, this journey, right? From, from in such a short amount of time as well. Would, I, mean, I mean, at this stage, you then turned it into a career. Um, you started going around the world traveling and, and doing these talks and being on TV and, you know, all these amazing things. Um, did you, you must have met a lot of people who thought you were gifted in the same way when you looked at that show for the first time, you thought that person's gifted or other people thought that. Would, would you say, and this is all down to what you learn and the strategy you learned and not to do with being gifted, or would you say it's down to talent as well? The problem is, I don't know. Okay. All I know, <laughs> all I know is one thing, and that is this. If I had a gift before I bought that book, that gift was very well hidden. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Because, you know, that gift, you know, it wasn't like a mole in the dark, you know, coming up yeah. in the lawn, having a quick look around. It didn't appear <laughs> at all. It didn't occur. I mean, there's yeah. nothing. People say, you must have known. And I go, no. I couldn't remember the 13 things on a fire extinguisher. I'm not exaggerating. I could not remember it. I'd get yeah. maybe 10 or 11 if I really pushed it. But then there's like 18 other books <laughs> I've got to read. There was nothing. So, no. you know, and I again, really I, always say, I always say the same thing. I think that the power of process mm. is everything. If you get a magnificent process, you know, that's going to take you a, an awful, awful long way, particularly mm. in something that doesn't require a predetermined level of ability. I could get, you know, even at 16, if I'd have had the best football coach in the world, I was never going to be Beckham. It was right. it would never have happened mm -hmm. because I just didn't have the, the gift. That's a gift. That's a talent surrounded by an insane amount of hard work. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, I always think of it more akin to being martial arts. When I was 13, I did, I did Shotokan Karate and I was a black belt at 18. I just did it through sheer grind. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. we, you know, being a black belt is a massively... It's, it's what we all want to do. You start, you start martial arts. You want to be a black belt. You mm. for almost any martial art. It's the recognition of mm -hmm. being in that top one or two percent or five percent, and you know, and across that's that's seen as the the level that you want to achieve. And we know that it just by sheer force of characters, just strength of character, sheer force of nature, you can just drive yourself through, and you're probably going to get it at some point. But mm. you've got to drive yourself through. And, you know, there's got to be some gift in there, a little bit of talent, a bit of ability. It's a magic mix, isn't it, Seb? Yeah, it was, it was memory. The thing that drove me was time. The, yeah. I bought that book and I had to go. And I'm sat there. I've got nothing else to do. I, you know, I've always been a gym monkey. I'm a competitive bodybuilder now. And what I do is, I, you know, I'd go to work, which is only two days out of eight being a firefighter. So I did two days, two nights, four days off. So I'm sat there twiddling my thumbs in my little bed seat. I didn't have a part-time job. So when I bought this book, I went, oh, what else is in this book? Carried on reading it. More stuff came out. So I, I was like, oh, maybe I could do 20 digits. So I remember mm -hmm. I was 20 digits. Okay, 40, 80, 100, 200, 400, 1,000. Because I had the time. So it was just sheer force of nature. Practice, 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 practice. Drive, drive, drive. Mm. And then in there may be a modicum of talent or gift, but essentially it was just hard work. It was just Amazing. a mental amount of practice. I love what you said about having, you know, it's that, that drive was just this, you know, sheer strength of character, right? And a, and a big part of what we do in the War Academy is, is it's, it, we try and make it less of a focus about getting a black belt and more of a focus about getting a black belt character. And that, that kind of focus that, you know, the, the, the ultimate goal is that development of character because it translates into so many other areas in your life, right? So, so from your perspective, what do you believe makes up someone's character? To, get, to give them that strength of character, what would you believe makes that up? I, I well, I, I believe it's innate, I'm afraid. Okay. My, my experience of, you know, of, of now being at a certain age where I've seen some kids 
you know, go from being quite young all the way to being in the 20s, 25. It's amazing how little people change. Really? And, and what age yeah. would you say that's from? I mean, if they, if they are, if they're, oh, they're, they're five year olds or if they're 15 year olds, what's the age no, where you feel that? Five or six. You know, you can see a kid at five or six in the playground, you know, they start at junior school, infant school, reception, nursery, and they sit there and, and the kid that instantly just goes and stands with the back to the wall and watches it all go on is, is the kid will be doing it 10 years later in the high school, uh, be doing it 20 years later at work, who'll be doing it, you know, if they come to a dojo, that's what they'll do. They'll stand there. You'll see that, you know, you know, you'll see kids come through, some will bounce through the door, some will need the parents to bring them. Other, other kids will come on their own and just kind of what, what, wonder what's going on. Some kids will look through the window 14 times before they dare walk through the door. And, they'll, and more or less, people are like that for life. So for me, you know, I'm all right now in this, in this, area, in this environment, but I'm what's known as a, an introverted extrovert. So I will be an extrovert when I need to be, but 99% of the time, I just, I just watch it all pass on in front of me. I'm not really fussed about meeting people. Even though it's been a problem, I'm good at it and I'm happy to do it. But if I, you know, we live up here in isolation because I don't particularly want to be around other people. I mean, the one thing that was really interesting, Seb, was going to a school reunion. And it was about <laughs> three years ago. So I was be about 48. So we'd all been 30, 32 years since we left school. And it was a working man's club up near me. And I turned up and you walked through the door and I swear down it was like the school disco really <laughs> yeah <The> two girls <laughs> that would stand no, in the nothing, corner. nothing had changed nothing had changed right it's exactly okay. the same the two girls that would stand in the corner going oh look at him look at what they were wearing they were still doing that stood on the end of the bar <laughs> the guy that was a social butterfly got you're right you're right you're right you're right he was still doing it you know the crazy guy first one onto the dance floor Woo! You know, and, and I did what I did back in the day, which is I went in, got myself a diet coat, went and stood at the back, watched it all unfold, stayed an hour, and I left by the back door. Mm -hmm. I'm going, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. You know that 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 people's personalities, um, you know, are, they're they're often formed when they're younger, and and they they certainly steer towards certain things in life, and they prefer, especially when it comes to being extroverted or introverted. But you know, in, in the same way, I think certain things happen in life which are either traumatic or or not, and that gives you the opportunity to kind of make or break your character, right? And for instance, someone like you, who's you, you mentioned introverted extrovert, no, ex extroverted introvert, or how did you put that? Either or. Which Either way. or. And, um, yeah. and for me, to, to someone who is in that position, if they are, you know, if they're put through different things in life and they step up to the challenge and they have this moment of courage, which gives them the confidence then afterwards, they're able to, to switch that, that kind of extrovert on later on in life, right? At certain points. So it's almost like they've learned to be it and they've got that confidence to show, to show that they can be extrovert and to have that courage later on. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that, I think you have the ability to step outside of yourself. But the, mm. the, what was interesting was how you framed it to start with. Mm. You said that people go through a traumatic experience and then they change. Mm -hmm. But in reality, they wouldn't have changed if the trauma hadn't happened. No. And most people are driven by fear. Yeah. So when you talk to adults, for example, and I say to them, you know, you know, what give me an example of great change that you've undertaken in the last five mm. years. 95% is, fear, is, peer, is, is pain or fear driven. They don't yeah. improve at work because they want to earn more money to buy a nice car. Mm -hmm. they, they have a child and all of a sudden yeah. they need more money. So I'd be sat there with off, guys at work in the fire service and we all went, officers, they're all idiots, they're all idiots, right? And then all of a sudden, one minute you'd turn around and Saturday night you'd be watching TV with the guys and he'd be off studying and you're going, you said officers were idiots. And he went, I've got a kid coming. Yeah, right. It's it's, in, it's interesting that, isn't it? That where where motivation comes from. We had um yeah. we had Jason Greystone uh, come on recently uh, for the Warrior Academy podcast, and he talked a lot about mindset. He's he's a he's a professional trader, so he's heavily into the psychology of you know human psychology and why people do certain things and and all the all this kind of background. And um you know one of the things he spoke about was how we're mostly driven by fear. And he had this really um if I can remember it, this really good metaphor where. And if you, as it, back in the caveman days, if you stepped out of your, your cave, 
um, and there was an option to get food or there was an option to, um, although well, the, the other side of there, there was a lion or something chasing you, you would stay in your cave, right, to avoid the danger. Rather than trying to gain something, you would seek that security or avoid that danger. So, so this is certainly driven by fear initially is, is what I think a lot of people feel. So I, so I totally agree with that. And I suppose that ties in quite well with, you know, what, what something that you, you often talk about, which is, you know, how you, know, how you can become world class. Could you dive in a little bit into that? What's, you, know, you spoke about processes. Do you have a process yeah. that you can pass on to people in, in terms of how they can approach that? How, how do you become world-class in anything? Well, like I said earlier on, the most important thing is, well, for me, it comes down to two things. What do you want to achieve? And for that, you've got to be fairly specific. If you decide you just want to earn a lot of money, that isn't specific enough because a lot of money to the guy who's a trader is, not a lot is is different to the guy who lives in Halifax in a one up one down, and so you know that's too vague. So you've got to be more specific about what it is that you wish to achieve, and then what you need to do is once you've really come to understand that if you don't achieve that, it's it's going to hurt you. It's going to be a painful experience. Then what you need to do is find somebody who's already there and ask them how they got there, and that's exactly what I've done all the way down the line. I've always gone for what what does world class look like? What is it? What is it I really, really want to achieve? And how do I get that by the shortest possible route? Because too mm. often there is this concept of incremental progress. You do this and then you get a bit better, then a bit better, then a bit better, and you bolt it on. Well, sometimes you can just go from there to there. I'll give you a quick example. I, decided, I wrote a book 10 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, and it was my autobiography, life story. And it was in a certain genre. And at the time... There was another guy that I knew who'd got a book that he'd written and it was number one bestseller. It went number one. And this wasn't an Amazon number one. This was like a proper, like a like the number one single of the week. It was a number one best-selling book and it sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And so I went to see him and I said, How does how do you do it? And he says, Well, you you need to get a you need to get a ghostwriter, you need to get an agent, you need to do this, 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 and this. And I was like, No, I'm not doing that. How much did he pay? And he told me how much he paid, and he paid out like two thirds of his advance to a, an agent and a ghostwriter. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. And he goes, Well, that's how it's done. You can't. And I said, No, I'm not doing it. So all I did was I looked in the, I got the Sunday Times, opened it up, saw the best selling books of the week, saw which books were selling the best in my genre, and then mm -hmm. I looked to see who the publisher was, and it was Harper Collins. What I did then was go online, find the number one editor in the number one publisher, and I phoned her up. So I phoned up Harper Collins, got the reception. I said, hi, my name's Dave Thomas. Can I speak to Sally Potter? And they went, yeah, is she expecting your call? And I said, yes, put me straight through. So this woman came on and she went, I don't know who you are. And I said, my name's David. I've got a book. Can I send it to you? I said, yeah. She said, yeah. So I sent it off. Two days later, I'm in the office. They made an offer of 50,000 quid, which 13 years ago was a lot of money to, as an advance. <laughs> I turned around, you know, I went to him. I said, I'll think about it. I went to him. I said, I want 100,000. <laughs> they went, we're not paying 100 grand. I said, well, fair enough, you're not getting the book. Two days later, they went, you've got your 100 grand. Oh, amazing. <laughs> it was just, it was just, no ghostwriter. So I didn't pay an agent. I didn't pay yeah. a ghostwriter. Kept it all. Wow. That's so pretty cool, isn't it? What I did was I looked at what world class looked like. For mm. me, world class was not the quality of the book. It was having a number one bestseller. Mm. So I'm not going out there. I'm not, I'm not an author. I'm not a literary genius. I can barely string a sentence together. The bottom line is, is I wanted it to go number one. Mm. I wanted to make good money from it, but I wanted the cachet that came from number one. So I knew that that's what number one. If most people would go, well, what do you want from a book? I want, I want, you know, somebody to say it's an amazing read. I don't care. I don't care if people find it's an amazing read. I don't care if people say the English is terrible. I'm not fussed. I wanted it to sell because it was a certain thing i wanted to achieve about telling my life story that would help people and the only way i'm going to help people is by selling a lot of books right and yeah people come to me and they go i've got a book and i go brilliant you sell about eight on your own and they go really and i go yeah trust me you'll get you'll pre you know self-publish everybody says self-publish it's a waste <laughs> of time you can sell about 50 copies all to your man <laughs> my opinion no brilliant brilliant so one of the things we spoke about in some of our conversations in the past was how you say, you know, instead of learning from anyone, you should only learn from someone who's world class in what they're doing. Yes, if you can find them. And yeah. nowadays, you can. nowadays you can, can't you? You can find yeah. them anything. I mean, you've you got masterclass. 
what an astonishing an astonishing resource i don't know if you've heard of it but masterclass.com i don't mm -hmm. know what it is it's something like 20 english pounds a month i think oh, i've seen the adverts yeah. pop up is, it, is this where you've got you know famous people incredible people who have done certain things and then they they basically make a course all yeah. on platform. yeah you've got <laughs> you know you've got martin scorsese telling you how to make films you've got gordon ramsay telling you how to make scramble <laughs> way and you go what and that's what they decided to do and that's why it's called masterclass and it's 20 yeah. quid a month you can do all these courses for free it, it may be a little bit more but it's not excessive yeah you go, wow, wow. No, so you've got the access to anything it's just it's no, just there's no barriers to entry anymore yeah but, but, but doesn't, 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 doesn't that in some ways just kind of drown you in opportunity so it's almost quite difficult to uh, to keep kind of accountable and motivated to go through a certain path because there's so much out there to choose right there's almost there's almost like information overload well you know my answer to your question is no, no. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you do get swamped the, the only people who get swamped are those are those people like little butterfly, you know, little bit little bees. They go yeah. in and a little bit of honey here and a little bit, you know, a little bit yeah. of pollen, a bit of pollen. No, decide what you want to achieve. I decided 25 years ago I was going to be an amazing memory guy. I didn't go off and try and be a go-kart rider. I didn't go off and try and play golf. I decided to be a world-class memory guy and I immersed myself in that. And that's why I became one of the best that's ever been. Not the best in <laughs> Halifax. I'm talking about in history, Guinness records, world records, US memory championships. I mean, you know, so the thing is, choose what you want and stick to it. I'm afraid we've frozen a little bit there, Seb. Back in. How's that? Any better? No, no, I'm good. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, this happened to me yesterday as well, but I figured out how to how to solve it. Now I think Streamyard are going a few uh, through a few issues, but uh, but that's cool. We're back on. Yeah, can, you can hear me fine. Yeah, I can. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a very simple analogy, and it's a Chinese proverb. You know, if you if you chase two rabbits, you catch neither. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So what we <laughs> see is. I could do this and I could do that and I could that. Well, no, you can't. You can't do everything. In, yeah. in life, you can't do anything, but you can't do everything. Just make a decision, mate. Whatever it is mm. that you want to do, just do that. It's a bit like somebody coming and going, I want to be a black belt, but I want to mm. be a black belt in judo, in shotokan, in, you know, jujitsu. And this, we can't do it because, you know, pick a, pick a martial art, to use the analogy. And you yeah. just go, do the one that you want to do that's the best for you. Well, it's whatever. But you can't do them all because there's only seven nights in the week and you're going to get injured. You know, you can't do them all. Some some mm. people do not fertilize. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a very simple concept. And that is, it, you know, it's it should be the other way around. People should just go, I can do anything. Let me decide exactly what's going to light my fire. Because the problem is we all have stuff we want to do that's going to be fun and interesting and exciting. The question is, is it going to be fun and exciting in three months? Is it going to be fun and exciting when that initial level of success which is huge the most success you have is in the first three months right yeah after that it, it starts to tail off because mm. that's when you go from you know like you go to the gym you can't lift anything and all of a sudden you go from lift, being able to you know bench press 100 pounds to 120 in a week that's 20 percent improvement it's unlikely mm. you're gonna have 20 percent improvement in a week ever again you get a lot yeah. stronger so but once you've got to that stage where it starts to just level out a little bit what's going to keep you going decide find out what really lights your fire a memory mm -hmm. did and being a speaker does and that's why I have, that's why i have a business now that is still moving forward in this environment because yeah. i could take it online because i'm good at this i'm really 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 good speaker 
you so combine therefore, the two things, you know, that you that you love the most, right? Speaking and, and memory. Mm. Now I've said to Karen, my missus, I've said, you know what, I'd love to learn to play a keyboard, learn to play the piano, and that'll just be a bit of fun. I'll do 20 minutes, half an hour a day. I'll probably get to the point where I can play a little bit of music. If I wanted to be great at it, I need to do two hours a day. I need to immerse myself in it. I'm not that fussed. I like the idea. And actually, I'm not even sure if I'm going to want, if it's going to mean enough. I think it will. But if it doesn't after three months, I'll sell the keyboard and I'll do something different. But mm. there's no point in me buying a keyboard and a saxophone and some a triangle. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, Seb, you know, without without wanting to, to be too glib, the problem isn't that we have an embarrassment of riches. It's not that there's so much stuff. It's that people just think they can do it all. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, so um, in terms of, I mean, that's that's all about kind of having that laser focus, being in touch with what your values and purpose is, you know, what you really enjoy, you know, finding what kind of lights your fire, as you said, and, and then having that laser focus to follow one thing and really pursue that one thing. And I, I guess that's what brings you to that world-class level. In, in terms of, um, you know, I'd, I'd really like to dig in um, to how our students at home right now who are who have maybe got exams coming up, maybe, maybe not right now, but they've, um, they're studying and they're struggling with studying and there's parents who are at home helping them with the homeschooling. What advice can you give to help parents um, with homeschooling their children? You know, one of the biggest tips overall, because Karen and I were talking about this because she was a math teacher for 14 years and I said, how do you feel about this? And, you know, we talked about it and actually the, the one thing that you want to try and do with, this, with your kids at home, if they have to study, some year groups may not need to study for the next four months. They could probably lose it, start again in September, and they'll just start again. So you're mm. talking about maybe the 11, 12, 13-year-olds. Maybe by the time you get into the kids who are 15, 16, they've got big exams next year because the big exams for this year, most of them worldwide have just been cancelled. Mm. But you know, next year, if they've got big ones and they have to do some study or they're getting work from school, the key is to think about what happens at school. At school, they don't get the chance to sit and eat in class, right? A very simple example. You know, the kids will sit there and do the homework and they'll be munching, they'll be munching crisps and they'll have the TV on and the phone going ding-a-lang, ding-dang-dong over there. They don't get that chance at school, do they? Yeah, no, true. It's so less distraction, just saying. It is. It's huge. It's a massive distraction. And so yeah, what you want yeah. to do is create as much of an environment that matches school as you possibly can. So for example, yeah. the, time table. the kids have a timetable at school, they get 25 lessons, they turn up at 11 for geography on a Monday morning. This isn't rocket science, sit down mm -hmm. and do it with them. Now, students, particularly the older they get, young adults, they wanna be in control of their own destiny, sit down mm -hmm. working out with them. So sit down and decide, right, you need to do this work, and they go, yes I do. Where are you gonna do it? Let's make sure you have a good environment to do it. You can do it outside in the sun if you wish, that's fine. Yeah. But let's make sure you have the right environment, you have access to the things that you need, you have the materials. If you you know, if you don't have your phone in class at school, what about turning your phone off for an hour and doing your homework and doing the yeah. work that you've got? So start thinking about it more in less in terms of come on, let's just come on, you know, let come on, come on, John. You know, make sure you go and do a bit of homework. No, I'll, it's all right, I'll leave it till tomorrow, Mum, and I'll do double tomorrow. And it's like, no, oh, okay, yeah, all right, <laughs> fine. You know, and there's all those conversations try and get into a pattern because otherwise a week will turn into a month or turn into two or three. And mm -hmm. then it's a bit like weekend homework, isn't it? Kids come home on a Friday, not doing homework on a Friday, been at school all week, right? Yeah. This is the UK. They get up on a Saturday and mum says, right, you're going to do a bit this morning. No, no, I'm, I'm going out to see John. I'm going partying, you know, tonight and I've got stuff going on. And then it's like, I'll do it all tomorrow. And then they wake up Sunday morning and they're like, Ooh. <laughs> and it's like, and now they've got eight hours of work. Oh dear. Okay. Now multiply, magnify that for a four month period. That's yeah. Awesome. But I mean, this is, this is this is the thing, isn't it? I mean, environment yeah. dictates performance, right? I mean, if you can if you can create that calm environment which mimics where they're used to or where someone's used to learning, then it really helps them. One of the things we're saying to our students is is create a dojo in your house, even if that's just the way you dress before you study your your, your online class with us, the way you bow when you enter the room. You're trying to set yourself up for a successful learning experience. You want to try and make the environment as similar to where you would normally learn that, you know? So, so yeah, completely with you on that. I think that's beautiful. 
you know, having done martial arts, I think that's really cool. I mean, we're in lockdown over here. So two days before lockdown, because I'm a competitive bodybuilder, I needed to train. So we've got a little outbuilding yeah. and we've got a mat off a friend. We've got a little bench that was made by my neighbor. I went out and got 150 kilos of plates. I got some little bars. We've got some little straps. And we've just got in there and we've made it really homely, set yeah. it up properly with a little cross trainer and everything else so that we can go in and we do our exercise. And, we, and it is literally, you know, we're going into the gym. So yeah. it's normally where we yeah. do the walking and we have the, the second fridge and so on. But, you know, we, we create an environment. And, and if you do that, it does make all the difference. At the community center and then you'd walk through the door and you walk you know but once you walk through the door into the room completely different bow and everything changes yeah completely yeah, yeah. i'm with you environment's key making sure you've got the right materials making sure you don't just leave the subjects you don't like until the end it's like it's like revision people always revise the stuff they like the most the most or they like they do that the most and yet that's a terrible strategy yeah. Because what happens if the stuff you like the least or you can't do? What happens if that comes up in the exam? And I always say, you know, make sure you have a, a, a proper approach to your, your education. If you can't study, make sure that you learn some strategies. Goodness me. If you mm. go online and put in into YouTube, divide dividing fractions video, you're going to come up with a thousand creative, funny, ridiculous memorable videos that are two minutes long where somebody's just decided to do something to show you how to divide fractions so don't struggle go out there and use the resources that are available amazing brilliant um it'd be great to talk about just just before we finish off today um could you give any tips about um activated learning because that was something activated. we brought up in, our, in one of our conversations before activated activated did learning what did, yeah, did you, did you mention activated learning to me before? Accelerated learning. Accelerated learning, not activated. <laughs> <laughs> whose memory Whose memory is the best, yours or mine? Well, I'd, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be kind to you and say it's probably my... No, no do, you, do you know what, David? You're, you're, I don't want you to talk about accelerated learning. I want you to talk about activated learning, all right? And go. <laughs> well, I was, actually, it's Karen here. She just went, accelerate. I was like, yeah, I, I, heard, I heard that in the background. We, we <laughs> were in here a long time, mate. Going, <laughs> but you I know. I'm sure you would. I'm sure you would have come up with something, though. <laughs> I'd have made it up on the spot. Accelerated learning. <laughs> accelerated learning. Basically, accelerated learning is exactly what it sounds. It is two things, really. It's about making sure you can learn more in less time. But it's also about being able to learn faster, the, kind of the, the same principle. But it's exactly what it says on the tin. And when it comes to it, um, the challenge that some students are going to have, particularly one year group who have got their main exams at 16 years old next summer, is that they're going to go back in September and they're going to have, with the best will in the world, they're going to have lost weeks, months of material, and they're going to have to catch up very, very quickly. Mm. And, so it's not just about intelligence or hard work or whether you're academic. It's just going to be sheer volume. So the two right. things I'm going to share very quickly are one, mind mapping. Mind mapping is a technique that's been around for 50 years. It's well known worldwide. Tony Bazan created it and I get a lot of resistance. So a lot of pe teachers and students say it doesn't work for me and I go, awesome. Do me a favor, just do a mind map. And what we find is that 90% are wrong. Really? <laughs> People see my mapping and it's got colors and pictures. They think it's a creative exercise so they can do it whatever way they wish. You can't. It's a neurological exercise. It mimics the way that the brain works and that's why it works. But the problem is if you don't do it the right way, you don't get the benefit. And yeah. yet people talk for maybe, you know, an hour in class once and that's all. And you just sit there and go, you know, and they talk the wrong way. You've got to be taught the right way. So if you mm. ever, not from me or anybody else, if you wish to, you get in touch. But essentially, if you want to learn mind mapping, you've got to learn to do it properly. And there's only one place to learn, and that is somebody who, who's done it like me for a long time. Well, two places, or from Tony Bazan. I mean, the guy's passed away, but any books by Tony Bazan, that's where you go. Mind mapping, Brilliant. incredible. The second one is just memory techniques. Mm -hmm. You know, we, th there are loads of memory techniques. I'll, get, I'll give you a quick for instance. Yeah, please do, yeah. We, we um, for example, if you've got to remember that the French for book is livre, 
for argument's sake. You know something you might have to learn in French vocab at GCSE? What you do is you take the word livre, turn it into liver, sounds a bit similar, and what you do is you put it, imagine it's in a book, right? So imagine opening a book and all the pages are made of liver. And that's what you do. Yeah. Or if you want to remember that one kilogram is 2.2 pounds, which is something that the kids have to learn in England, imperial metric measurements, then what you do is imagine a one kilogram block and imagine it's wearing a 2.2. 2.2. Brilliant. I love that. So, so essentially what you're saying is you're, you're removing the word or the number and you're changing it to just something you can associate and visualize, like something, something physical you could, you could kind of visualize in front of you. And people always say to me, that, that's not going to work for me. That's nuts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. did a session yesterday with an amazing girl called Grace. I showed her a mind map. I said, the fire of London. I said, it started yeah. in Pudding Lane. Pudding Lane. So I put a little, drew a little picture of rice pudding. And I showed it to her, I think it was a week ago. And then yesterday I came on, I said, how are you doing? And she went, you know, I can still remember the rice pudding on the mind map. And Amazing. we understand that this is how the brain works. So mind mapping work, if it's done well and done properly, it works because it synchronizes with the brain. And yeah. memory training exactly the same. People go, why would I bother with all those images? Because we remember them. I've said one kilogram wearing a tutu. Nobody listening to this will not, will ever forget that. Ever? No. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, David, we're going to come. We're going to schools three months later, and we go. I can still remember the one kilogram. Really? It's two, amazing. Two. And then, then I guess it's just practice. It's just doing it again and again and again. So it just becomes a, you know, a natural technique that you just do. And um, David, that was absolutely amazing. I really, really appreciate you coming on. You know, hearing hearing about your inspiring story and also the amazing tips you've given our students and our Warwick family in the UK and Dubai uh, for getting world class, and then those amazing, you know, accelerated learning techniques really appreciate you coming on mate my pleasure good luck to everybody be world class thank you